Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, Deputy Mayor, we can hear you. Well, good good morning, everyone, and, and welcome uh, uh, to this special uh, budget meeting of the Barry Police Service Board for September 12, 2024. I'd like to call the meeting to order and begin with our land acknowledgement. In keeping with Indigenous protocol and building respectful relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada, is customary to acknowledge the traditional territories and ancestral lands of Indigenous peoples. We would like to acknowledge this sacred land on which the very simple emergency service campus operates. It has been the site for human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the ancestral land of the Wendat and the Ashnabi Nation. The treaty that was signed for this particular parcel of land is collectively referred to as the Williams Treaty. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land and are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect. Big wish. Thank you. Our, mo our uh, agenda was distributed in advance, a motion to approve uh, today's agenda. Not all. On. Uh, any amendments, questions with respect to today's agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor? I should add that uh, for those that are watching, uh, maybe watching either live or later, that uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson has it has joined us. He is uh, virtually this morning. Um, any conflicts of interest? Uh, any members of the board have with respect to today's agenda? Seeing none, uh, we'll move right into our special presentation this morning. First draft of the 2025 Ferry Police Service Operating Capital Budget. Uh, just a bit uh, of an introduction before we uh, uh, get into the presentation. Staff have been working on this for many, many months, uh, hundreds of hours by, by many of our staff to, to get to where we are today. The board appreciates all the hard work and effort that's gone into it. I thank you for that. The, the purpose of today is for the board to receive the, the, the first draft of the, the budget. Uh, we will then uh, uh, do our due diligence and review the, that budget. It, it is the intent that on our October 17th meeting, we will uh, approve uh, the budget or amended budget or change, but we will finalize the budget process from our perspective at our October 17th. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Chief Johnston, to uh, begin our presentation. You have a number of your, uh, our staff, I should say, not your staff here today. I appreciate everyone's presence. I'll hand it over to you, Chief. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, myself and our finance manager, uh, Tyrell, uh, will uh, go up to the podium uh, to do the presentation. Uh, the team here today is reflective of our broad service, but certainly open to um, answering any questions the board may have with respect to uh, what you're about to uh, what you're about to see. Good morning, members of the board. Together with the chief, deputy, Jenna, and my team in finance, we put together our proposed 2025 budget request with the goal of finding the balance between fiscal responsibility and ensuring the service has the necessary resources to meet the expectations of the community, both now and in the future. Like last year, we've identified three main themes of the 2025 budget. These align with the buildup of the budget requirements over 2024, and we've done our best to break out each financial pressure for a greater understanding of contributing factors and to allow for better decision making. The three main themes are staffing and service levels, legislative requirements, and technology and innovation. As we look forward to 2025, our intention is to prepare a fulsome budget plan that considers not only the financial and people resources, but also identifies current and future risks and opportunities. 
Under risk, you will notice the first three listed here are legislative requirements with the new Community Safety and Policing Act, the WSIB legislation for mental stress injuries, and the NG911 provincial rule. The next two relate to upper level government funding streams. And finally, we wanted to recognize that we understand and appreciate the difficult economic environment that many member, members of our community are experiencing. As well, we will demonstrate throughout the presentation how the service with the support of the board has been able to leverage existing opportunities to minimize financial pressures, avoid significant risks and costs, and make strategic investments for the future. The first building block of our 2025 budget, we have labeled as 2024 carry forward items. As you may recall, when we built the 2024 budget, we did not have a collective agreement in place. The 1.16% you see represents a shortfall between the budgeted provision included in the 2024 budget and the projected actual cost of the new collective agreement. We've tried to illustrate that although the shortfall for 2024 has been mitigated with the allocation of the 2023 year end surplus, the shortfall of about 787,000 still needs to be picked up in the base operating budget for 2024. The 0.89% represents the full year cost of approved 2024 new positions. The sworn members were budgeted for a June 1st start date, and the new civilian positions were budgeted with an October 1st date. The annualization of these positions to account for a full year cost represent the 0.89 impact on the 2025 budget. And finally, as you may recall, we had an above average level of retirement costs in 2024. We had originally recommended the increase be funded from the operating reserve, However, the board's recommendation to accommodate this in the base budget has meant that we can now lower the expected retirement cost back to typical levels, resulting in a budget decrease of 0.53%. We'd now like to invite the chief to speak to staffing and service to the community. Thanks, Ty. Uh, as we've stated in the past, our members are the core of the Barry Police Service. We provide and the service we provide to the community and they are our greatest resource and represent roughly 95 percent of our total budget best measure service to our community is not the metric of our sworn authorized complement which hasn't increased in the past four years in our growing city but rather the metric of the number of deployable sworn officers that are available to work and support our community's safety and well-being needs our sworn officers not only respond to calls for service, but also conduct hotspot patrols, undertake proactive harm reducing investigations, and engage with the community. With the board's support, we've been closing the gap between authorized complement and deployable officers each year. For 2025, we've continued with this strategy to replace six members who are currently off on WSIB with mental stress injuries and who are not expected return to work. We believe it's necessary to continually review and analyze our existing resources to ensure we are positioned to most effectively allocate resources to our frontline members and provide the highest level of service to our community. In the past 18 months, we've made several organizational changes to remain lean and focused on community response. I would like to invite Staff Sergeant John Brooks from the Barry Police Service Association to speak to the impact the additional resources are having on the frontline platoons. Thanks, Chief. Uh, good morning, members of the uh, Barry Police Services Board. As the president of the association and Staff Sergeant on Frontline Patrol, I can tell you that we are constantly monitoring our staffing levels to ensure that we are adequately resourced to meet the needs of the community. As you can imagine, when our staffing levels are reduced, this puts a great strain on our existing officers to pick up the additional workload. This can lead to burnout, low morale, increased occupational stress, and the likelihood 
that our healthy members become unhealthy and unable to work. This then adds further strain to an already strained work environment. With the additional resources provided in 2024 through the board's commitment to replacing members off on mental stress injuries, and the chief and the senior management's commitment to refocusing and bolstering the frontline resources, we are in a much better position than we've been over the last several years. Although we have made good progression, I urge the board and the senior management of the service to continue with your efforts in increasing our deployable resources. With the city's continued expansion, it is imperative we continue to grow and prepare for the future strain that will be placed on our policing resources. Additionally, I would like to acknowledge the board and the service for your focus on the additional supports for member wellness and mental health. They are greatly appreciated and meaningful to the membership of the Barry Police Service. On behalf of the association, we want to take this moment to share our appreciation with the board's continued recognition of the importance of supporting the well being of our members. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to the chief. Thank you, Staff Sergeant Brooks. The chart before you represents both community reported and proactively detective harm and the correlation with our resource levels. While increased resources doesn't impact community reported harm, we can see the direct correlation of resource levels with proactive, proactively detected harm. We believe this is where we can make the greatest impact and reduce and deter overall crime within the city. The Barry Police Service continues to make concerted effort to engage in proactive policing and proactive patrols of high harm areas in an effort to deter and prevent crime and high harm from taking place. While our city is growing, and unfortunately community reported harm is increasing with that growth, we can also see the impact that our proactively detective harm is having. Proactively detected harm refers to things like arrests for drug trafficking, firearms being taken off the streets, traffic stops, and bail violations. From this chart, we can see that when our proactively detective harm is higher, it aligns when our uh, with the times when our staffing levels are highest. The city is growing and changing, and with that comes an increased number and complexity of calls received. Our CAD created events or calls for service have increased by 28% since 2017, and the demand on police resources to support community safety is greater than ever. And back over to you. Second building block of our 2025 budget is non discretionary. These are areas of the budget we have little or no ability to influence due to contractual, third party, legislative, or necessary requirements to meet the needs of our growing city. Salaries for 2025 are a direct result of the prescribed wage increase within our contract and include all reclassifications, transfers, promotions, premiums, and retirements. Benefits reflect provisions within our new contract. However, the overall impact has been minimized through our recent shared open procurement with the city to ensure our benefit providers are providing competitive rates. Our rates for life insurance, long-term disability, and accidental death and dismemberment are fixed for three years, while our other benefits are subject to prescribed. Legislative impacts represent provincial directives that impact our budget. The chief will speak to these more in detail shortly, but I will highlight, as you can see, that we have proposed an additional communicator position in 2025 budget in anticipation of the increased impact coming from the NG911 platform, as well as overall volumes being experienced in this area. Pricing increases being experienced from vendors and existing contracts represent 0.28% increase over our 2024 budget. This is approximately one third of the inflation we were experiencing a year ago. And finally, the last significant impact we have categorized as growth related. These represent non-staffing related items such as licensing, data storage, 
devices and equipment such as CCTV. Non-discretionary items represent a total of 4.41% increase on our 2025 budget. Now the chief will speak to our second main theme, legislative requirements. As Ty mentioned, we wanted to spend some time highlighting the three main legislative areas that are impacting our 2025 budget. The first relates to the WSIB legislation that was first introduced in 2016 and supports members that are suffering from mental stress injuries. This is a topic we have covered in detail over the past few years and one that will continue to present a significant financial impact to all police services in the coming years with the frequency that first responders are exposed to traumatic events. The chart showcases the increased mental stress injury claims across the province in blue and how the Barry Police Service has been able to minimize and sustain our relative percentage of claims compared to the province. At present, Barry Police has maintained the current number of members that are off due to mental stress injuries, and we've had success supporting return to work transitions with the wide range of wellness initiatives to support our members and help them manage their exposure and response to trauma. By building a strong preventative and early intervention program, we hope to protect our members from experiencing negative mental and physical health impacts related to their work. These investments made in member wellness along with the added mental health supports have minimized the overall impact to 0.17% for, uh, for the 2025 budget. With the introduction of the new Community Safety and Policing Act on April 1st, 2024, the service has been adapting to the various new legislative requirements. Three main areas resulting in added costs are new uniform specifications, active attacker requirements and equipment, and new mandatory training focused on mental health crisis response and incident command. The service is exploring any and all opportunities to minimize the financial in impact through hosting courses in-house, partnering with other police services, and developing protocols to provide shared access to required equipment and services to meet the new legislation. The final legislative impact is driven by the provincially prescribed next gen 911 rollout, which will provide additional functionality for residents. The service has received 1.5 million in grant funding for the first two phases of this project and has applied for an additional 281,000 in phase three. However, the service is also planning and preparing for the ongoing sustainability with required IT infrastructure, data security and storage and the anticipated increased resources in our communications unit required to meet the expanded functionality. Ty will now come back up and introduce the final section of our budget presentation. We've categorized the final building block of our 2025 budget as discretionary. These are areas within the service we look to find opportunities to offset financial pressures, make strategic investments, and prioritize new staffing requests to ensure the service is positioned to respond to a growing and changing city while increasing transparency and mitigating risk. The first staffing request you see is a continuation of last year's strategy to replace a total of 12 members, six in 2024 and six in 2025, that are currently off work on WSIB resulting from mental stress injuries for greater than two years. With the goal of increasing our deployable officers to the community without increasing our authorized complement of 250. We would plan to hire new officers for July 1st, 2025, resulting in an impact of 0.46% on the 2025 budget. The full year salaries and benefits would result in a light 0.46% impact on the 2026 budget. Next, with the expansion of body-worn cameras and the associated work required to store, redact, archive, and prepare for briefings, we are requesting an additional resource in our digital evidence management unit. This is proposed for January 1st and would impact the 2025 budget by 0.1%. The last staffing request is an increase to our casual budget for special constables of 700,000. 
Special constables would continue to be utilized to support the downtown initiative, frontline platoons, and provide additional support to cells as needed. Revenue and efficiencies include increases in user fees, such as pay duties, criminal record checks, and fixed asset sales, increased interest revenue and savings achieved in fuel, insurance, and other efficiencies identified across the service. Collectively, these have reduced the budget request by 1.9%. Finally, we are requesting a minimal investment in technology and innovation that would result in a 0.12% on our 2025 budget. The chief will speak to some of the ongoing technology initiatives and the final theme of our budget presentation. As you're probably aware, I believe in the value that technology can bring to our organization. Recently, I had the opportunity to visit the headquarters of the Chicago Police Department and see firsthand the impact of technology on real-time operational policing in a large city. Although Chicago, the Chicago Police Department is one of the top three uh, largest police services in the United States, NYPD uh, being the largest, I believe the Barry Police are perhaps further ahead in, in some aspects of our technology, while still remaining cognizant of our fiscal responsibility. The technologies listed here are a few of the ways that we are enhancing our capabilities as a service, increasing safety and transparency to our community, protecting our members, and developing the infrastructure to be future ready for our growing and changing city. As always, we explore all available grant funding opportunities to help offset the investments we are making in technology. And the net impact of these and other technologies are 0.12% on our 2025 budget. With a carryover from 2024 of 1.52%, combined with the 2025 requirements of 4.27%, our total budget request is 71.4 million, which is an increase of 3.9 million or 5.79%. This does not include any provision for increased assessment revenue from growth within the city, which historically has been in the 2 to 3% range. Before we conclude our presentation, we had a couple of final items for consideration and communication. The first is a budget amendment that we're hoping to make. This would include an increase in expected savings from salary gapping and an offsetting increase to our overtime budget with a net zero impact on our budget request. Historically, we've realized more salary gapping savings than budgeted and also experienced overages and overtime compared to budget as a result of stat holidays, major incidents and shift supplement requirements. This amendment would realign both budgets to give us more accurate and realistic budget to actuals going forward. We also wanted to identify two known pressures for 2026. The first would be driven by the 2025 staffing requests, resulting in a 0.56% increase in 2026 with the full year annualization. The last item is related to our existing tasers for sworn members. Our current tasers are end of life and the service is waiting for the approval and distribution of the new taser 10 model, which will come with increased functionality and effectiveness. We will continue to research and work with our current vendor to mitigate financial pressures, but we believe there will be a significant cost coming in late 2025 or 2026. With that, we'll turn it back to the board for any questions or directions on the proposed 2025 budget requirements. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, gentlemen, for your presentation. Uh, Staff Sergeant Brooks, thank you for taking the, the time to, to speak with us this morning. Uh, the board uh, has been very clear that the, the relationship between this board and the association is critical to the success of the service and, and servicing our community members. So thank you for your continued support, John. Uh, any questions from the board for uh, the chief and or Mr. Turner? Start. I'll probably have several questions, but I'll start with one and go from there. Um, one of the areas of the presentation is staffing and service to the community. And chief, you touched on how our staffing really is our service to the community. If we don't have any staff, then we don't have a lot of service. 
Um, and we spent some time in the presentation discussing the 250 complement of sworn officers. I'm wondering if we have any data or like if you can provide us with some numbers on the number of special constables that we have. Um, there's a line item to increase the number of special constables. And if you could just discuss how many special constables we already have, what that number, like the 700,000, how many people does that equal if we can get it or like more about the impact to the service? Because I know that our staffing complement, while we talk a lot about sworn officers, the sworn officers are need the special constables of the civilians and the all of the people that are employed by the Barry Police Service work together and are part of a team. So um, just a little bit more information on that please would be helpful. Certainly, um, before I turn it over to uh, our HR manager, uh, Steve Allen, with specific answer with the, the number, because it doesn't actually equate to people per se, it's the hours available to work. Um, but I, I do want to recognize the point. Yes, it's the, um, that's the, the, that 700,000 hits for the special constable, the casual pool. But the reality is obviously the, there's an interrelationship with every single person in this room, but every area, and they all rely on each other. So uh, the, the value of having that um, to support frontline operations is incredible uh, and our ability to redeploy in some aspects people to the front line with a direct result of that so with that if it's a agreeable chair i'll hand it over to our uh, good morning and thank you for the, the question my my answer is maybe a little bit less specific than you had hoped for um the seven hundred thousand dollars contained in the budget is an increase to our casual special possible salary pool the number of casual special constables that we have can fluctuate wildly at, at different times of the year um, because one of the things that it is is the de facto cadet program or our smart hiring model. So when we bring on a casual special constable, we do that for a number of reasons deliberately. The, the first of which the actual definition for casual employment is somebody who is not here in any number of minimum hours and is scheduled as for the operational needs of service. So there are hours of work based on uh, demand, pilot projects, time of year, et cetera, can vary from, from zero to 44 per week. Um, typically, we're running with a number of around 30 casual special constables, but if for whatever reason they apply for and receive full time positions here, we have another intake and can, and can you know, decrease or increase by as many as a dozen at a time. Um, there's certain employment advantages to that being, you know, we're not making a commitment to a, a, a full-time employee, we're making a commitment to a budgeted number of funds to deploy that resource within the region. But I hope that is at least a little bit helpful in letting you know where we're at. We, we do have a, a core group of um, 14 full-time spectrum constables, which have been long-standing positions, but the lion's share of those are, are non-full-time members, either being um, on contract within uh, this facility or casual members working primarily at courts and in other areas that was possible. Please continue. Thanks. Uh, just on the same vein along the staffing and service to the community with the replacement of six officers um, that are not expected to return from WSIB. Are those hires new officers, new recruits, or experienced officers? So over the last several years, uh, we've been operating on the basis that we're doing blended hiring. So that would be a blend of both experienced officers uh, and new recruits. There are certainly challenges with new recruits in the sense that uh, there's unprecedented demand at the Ontario Police College. You know, we may ask for this year, for example, uh, we asked for 24 seats. Um, we'll be very lucky to get the majority of those, but it, it's not a guarantee anymore that if you ask for a number, you receive that number. And in fact, often you receive fractionally less than that. Uh, as a result, we've started hiring experienced police officers several years ago. And organizationally, I think we were all in alignment. It's shown a very, very good blend of experience and new. Uh, and the platoons that have certainly uh, you know, seen tremendous value in those experienced officers, primarily from larger services to offer that own skill set to vary. 
So for next year, we would plan on that blend. It would probably work out to depending on, you know, the, the candidate mix, roughly a, a third experience thing and two thirds. I guess just as a follow up to that and not necessarily for this meeting, but maybe for a future meeting, um, that could be something that we discuss the places available at the Ontario Police College. And if that's meeting our needs, and perhaps there's some advocacy that the board could do around that. I don't know if, um, if anyways, I'm just saying if we can make a note of that for perhaps a future discussion at a future board meeting. Not any further questions. Go away. We're not all questions. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. And I had a couple of questions. WSID, the last uh, budget presentation, so you call there was discussion of the number of individuals that being able to be moved from WSID to uh, active. And sometimes with the laws, sometimes it's like you know, to to part organizations at very place. Where we, I think you said the number is constant in the previous year. Is there is that is that accurate, or did we have some folks changing status a little? Good morning. Um, we did actually have some successful return to work this year, which is wonderful. Um, the problem is only two of those actually returned to frontline duties. So what we find most often in the central stress injuries is that although there is back to work in some capacity, either it's not full-time hours and it's not frontline deployable. So we find admission in the service as impacting for city rights, but they're not actually deployed locked. Uh, and if I could, and that just that be that uh, metric that we spoke about the important metric is that um, it's that uh, uh, fully deployable. And that's the important part. Right? They you're seen on that front line and impact our community. Sure. Um, in terms of the special cost, I had a similar question to um, the in there, but so it was seven for K going to. As an increase, right? That's not the overall budget, it's an increase in that budget. And saw it tied in under the slide of um leave us some of the front line downtown. I think it's that correct or my thing to this together. So it was in the section of new or additional staffing requests. So independently of their staffing requests, but yeah, combining their staffing requests for the front line, you know, the down's position as well. What percentage uh, would end up being frontline if that would be 100%? So we can, we'll get, we can get that specific for you, but ju um, just in terms of um, that, a portion of our special cost will, will, will assist. Oh, I think Steve's going to jump in, but just um, our ability. Uh, so in redeploying other resources within the organization, to the front line uh, came from our special constables, putting them into cells, as opposed to removing some of our sworn people that were there. There's, there's a, it depends on how you look at it to a degree, but Steve, you want to try to pull it on that? Thank you. Um, so I'll speak to the two pilots that we've been running this year, uh, which is directly reflected in that slide. So we have a, a downtown uh, community engagement special constable. Uh, there are currently four special constables partnered with police officers working the downtown for that's running from May to October of this year as a pilot. Uh, additionally, there are four special constables deployed uh, as equipment special constables who are tasked with um, what is permitted under the new CSPA for load, load priority types of calls. So things like uh, scene security, guarding a prisoner at the hospital, things of that nature. So we can have a special constable deployed for that, which results in the police officer and the police officer responsibility. So that certainly gets very efficient in perspective from a resource employment perspective. Um, the pilot, you know, the end of the pilot results will wrap up towards the end of October, but at this point, 
they've been very successful but i think the service would like those to stay the ones forward uh, again derived from a casual pool of money that it is not making it's a full-time member of budget and no, it's a resource okay and then um please jump into what this thing is because under that area but really you guys the same subject our new hires in uh that are being requested for july 1st when would those folks be able to be active duty? The new hires in terms of the subscribing officers, uh, our, our goal would be to have them um, fully deployable by the 1st of July. So we would bring them on, especially if those experience hire two to three weeks in advance of that for their, for their uh, orientation training. Um, a brief coach officer period, and that would be a fully deployable frontline resource for those busy summer months. For the October meeting, could you um, provide us with what the uh, change in uh, request would be uh, if we were to hire them as a thing first and second July? Is that even possible as well? Can we get that back to work for the entropy? Uh, so in, in recruiting, we always play challenges and would, uh, would love nothing more than to rise to that task. And I, I think we can provide that. Now that's it. Thank you, Chair. And uh, first off, uh, Staff Sergeant Brooks, thanks again for um, providing that insight and feedback. And uh, I know it's something that even when you're not in the room um, is on our minds. So uh, it's good to know that you're members are doing well. So thanks for that. Um, through you, Chair, to uh, Chief and uh, Mr. Turner. Um, I'll do my best not to repeat any of the questions. Um, one of the things that came to mind, Mr. Turner, when you were speaking uh, was your mindfulness of the economic pressures within the community. Um, kind of two-parters or, or looking at it two different ways. What are some of the things that you've taken into consideration that we can be aware of won't be compromising anything? I, I know basic delivery and, and mandatory and legislative delivery, absolutely, but other things that won't be compromised that we can take into consideration or that you are aware of. And what would you have done differently had you not had to take that into consideration? I'd just like to get some idea of what that looks like. But uh, just start by saying that uh... You know, we spent quite a bit of time with the chief and other leadership team kind of going through line by line of our budget to make sure that everything that's included in there is, you know, a need, not a want. Um, and I think that's reflected in the revenue efficiency section. You know, we also look to maximize any revenues where we can. So, you know, starting internally, I think that's the starting point for us to see, you know, where we can find those savings and efficiencies within our budgets. And we've done our best to try and bring that forward. You know, the difficult part is the, obviously the non-discretionary or non-controllable areas. Those are such a significant, you know, part of our overall budget. So, you know, there's very little room to, you know, have discretion in those areas. The only area that really, you know, we have influence or have more influence is the discretionary areas. And those tend to be more on the staffing and additional services that we're looking to take on. You know, very minimal investment in technology and then additional staff. That's kind of how I would bring it I'm going to jump on there as well. And I just, uh, with, uh, with respect to the technology, and as I had mentioned, um, line by line, looking for those savings and uh, uh, credit across the board to the team. But in, in IT in particular, there were a number of projects uh, I wanted to drive forward. And it, not that we scaled them back, but it had to be looked at to a different perspective. Uh, again, from a public safety perspective. We want to know what's going on in our city. Um, there was a desire to uh, um, to look at all of the on and off ramps and across the city where we could uh, have cameras set up uh, in terms of, you know, we have missing people, elderly, vulnerable children, and you live and breathe it every day when you see it in the media. We have crime that occurs, mischief, for everything from mischief, car theft, which is a plague right now within Ontario and Canada, uh, to the incredibly violent uh, acts and, and our attempts to investigate those. And so, uh, exploring the, our ability to, um, you know, purchase and uh, allocate cameras uh, to various places within the city, in addition to what we already have. With uh, with respect to IT and our ability to do that, we're now looking at partnering with our city and accessing those cameras after a uh, 
a thorough and, uh, and very robust uh, privacy impact assessment. It's just we really looking at different ways of doing it. We're looking at uh, victim choice reporting, where the in individuals are able to call in using software that's now available. Um, that uh, it's a virtual call with a police officer sitting there, and they they discuss the call. The initial uh, product we were looking at, magnificent, except incredibly expensive. IT does a lot of diligence, and we found a far, uh, I would say, a superior product at a, uh, a fraction of the cost. So everything that we were looking at. We we're looking at to minimize the impact the, for the taxpayer, but recognizing there's still a demand for a high level, superior level of public safety. Uh, thank you both. Um, I think, Chief, you touched on my concern, um, and, and I'd like to remain mindful of it while we are being conscientious of budget and those fiscal constraints that everybody is feeling. I, I can't help but think that that's also playing into the cause of the increase in calls for service and the types of service and the types of uh, crime or nuisance crime or things that we're experiencing as a service and as a community. And I want to make sure that we don't see a double negative in terms of the results to public safety and, and just overall community wellness. Uh, to be fair, with, with growth comes the growth of all areas. Prosperity, but also those and the challenges that come with that. Um, we we're an incredibly fortunate city, but we still experience the pains that every other city in Ontario and Canada does, especially with the opioid addiction and homelessness and the challenges we face. Social disorder will grow as a, uh, as a, uh, with some relation to the growth of our city. And we are growing as a city, and it's a positive, healthy growth, but we are still faced with those challenges. So, um, regardless of what we do, and, like, and we will address it, there, we, there's an, an expectation and a realization that uh, the demand on our police service will continue to grow as a result of the growth of the city, which is normal within any given population. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, I did notice just under the legislative, you identified a couple of areas, including after the backer. I didn't notice public order. Uh, was that just because it's not a, uh, I believe under the, under the act, the public order, um, element or unit is required. Is it that we have it, but there's no actual budgetary impact? Is that why it's not on the list? Uh, there are an, a, a number of new requirements. Um, that is not a new requirement. There is, it's been there at carryover. Um, and with respect to uh, our use of, uh, while we do not currently assess a public order unit, looking at the response for um, as a police service, you look at, uh, what resources are available, and we don't simply look at our borders. Uh, we are part of police services in Ontario, uh, and there is a uh, an acknowledgement that uh, economies of scale exist. So resources that a city our side need on a regular basis, tactical support, uh, and uh, identification service, all this specific stuff, and those uh, specialty units we uh, we do possess. But with something uh, like a public order unit, uh, we've made arrangements with other police services. Uh, for the provision of those services should they be required uh, on those and it's been not covid but i'm trying to think of the time where we've ever we had a unit that's never used a locally deployed uh, and has yet to within the last 27 years that i've been here so it is possible but we we do work in the realm of uh, what challenges we face right now and into the near future and, uh, right now that's um, uh, we've made arrangements to have that provided for us. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, who is joining, joining, joining us virtually. Any uh, questions from you, sir? Thanks, Chair. Actually, uh, I don't have any at the time. Uh, I went through the budget and stuff first. I just want to thank the team. Uh, lots of hours go into this and uh, understanding the financial environment that we're in so i do appreciate all the work um the only thing i would ask um, and i know the chief had started doing this that when the budget is accepted by the board and the service if we could set up the meetings with other members of council mm -hmm. to give them the opportunity with you and ty to understand uh, you know, our budget on an in-depth uh, perspective that's it thanks 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, that is our intention to reach out to every single um, councillor uh, with the intent of inviting them or meeting them wherever they want to meet. Um, we want to answer any questions uh, that any of the councillors may have, because at the end of the day, it is about transparency to this police service. We want the public to trust us. We need to be as transparent as possible to explain, you know, where those valuable tax dollars go and why they're being spent in the way they are. We cost money. Public safety costs money. We acknowledge that. But it's necessary. And we're unapologetic about it. It is necessary. And so we will uh, articulate why we're asking for what we're asking uh, and its intent and its purpose. That is our role. We want to provide public safety and make this uh, a, a safe community where people feel safe and it is safe. Thanks, Chief. Uh, more a comment, I guess. We get the deployment uh, born. Um, why back up? Is that possible? Thank you. Um, this slide to me is, is is the most critical in terms of our budget, and you know, I I I, guess I know I speak for the board that we're extremely proud that we're we're sh shrinking that gap, and that gap uh, is critical. It's still there. We're still short twelve to the the magic two fifty, um, and the magic two fifty hasn't moved in ten years, so. At some point, the, the upper line's got to change as well. Uh, with the city growing, the city's going to be what are twenty five thousand people. So you know, it, it's it's one thing to close the gap between the two fifty number, but when does that two fifty? It's not more a question. I'm just we got we, we need to put thought to shrinking that gap, and then looking at actual increase in what. The resources we need to uh, provide the service to our community. So I'm proud that we went from 219 to 238. I want to see it to go to 250 as the objective of the board. And then that 250 needs to be looked at to say, should it be 275? You know, at some point in time, uh, unless we find the magic pill, that that, that number is going to have to. To, to increase in order to provide the service that the, the citizens of this uh, city expect our police service. It's more a statement, but I am extremely happy that we continue to grow again. And I think what part of the reason why staff, uh, Sergeant Brooks, you know, uh, the association that 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 slide is extremely important. We should continue, and that's the biggest cost of our budget is that slide. It says a lot and. We wouldn't be able to go forward without the, by my the efficiencies that we found elsewhere in our discretionary uh, part of our budget. That allows us to 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 keep the the request down. Uh, my last comment is: I have talked to a number. I've had I had the opportunity to talk to a number of uh, other board members, and, and the the challenges they're facing are significant as well. So it's not, this isn't unique to the Barry Police Service and the cost of, of uh, providing services to the city. Uh, we're going to see a challenge right across the entire sector and the numbers that are going to be requested. The challenges we have in the area of recruitment. It's great that we say we want to get an additional six officers. It's not an easy process at today's time. So it was a little bit of an editorial, not a question, but as the chair, I took the privilege of of, of doing that. Um, um, any other questions from any board members at this stage? Please, Ms. Um, in past presentations, we usually see a line for WSIB and our WSIB reserve. I didn't see that in this presentation. Can you just let me know why? The last two years, we've increased our contribution to the WSIP reserve. It went from 
300 to 500 to 700. This year, we're actually projecting to be just a little bit under 700. So we still think that annual contribution is appropriate, but that would change in the future. Then we bring back some Good, Thanks. Any other questions from the board or, or Deputy Mary Thompson? Any final comments, uh, Chief, uh, before we conclude the meeting? Uh, thank you, Chair. I I actually, I just I want to pass it over uh, to our human resource manager, Steve Bound, because you're appreciative that it's uh, the, that our board is cognizant of, of our growing city, and uh, and we look at that 250 number, but you're also future focused, and we know our city is growing and the challenges are growing, uh, but we're already looking for that. And Steve, do you want to? Yeah, thank you, Chief. Uh, for you to the board, you know, we're always looking at our HR uh, strategy, your fiscally responsible lens, and that's one of the main reasons you haven't seen an increase in the, the ask for the number of uh, That number has been flat for a number of years, by going forward, uh, and we're taking really a multifaceted approach there. We're right now very, very interested in. Some special costumes um, for appropriate ambition and effective with the panel and I would that we see very positive results in that they, that may be an area of growth uh, in future HR access. Um, right now, our, our plan is written and it is a good plan to stop a digital hand to the growing city. Um, we will not see a request from us for that number to change until 2027. Uh, it is in our strategy to ask for two additional police officers and new in 27 and 28 uh, to add one additional police officer. So the more in total, one for the noon uh, by the end of 2028. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Anything else? Not seeing anything. Our next board meeting is a week today, September the 19th. That's our normal monthly. Board meeting, a motion to adjourn. Meeting adjourned. Thank you again, everybody, for all the, the work that's gone into getting us to this stage. We have the board appreciates you. Thank you.